Hi, I'm Dennis Kellogg, News Director for NET, Nebraska's PBS and NPR stations. Thanks for joining us for this live stream event as part of the National Wellbeings Project. The Wellbeings campaign is focused on youth mental health, and it's created by the public media station in Washington, WETA, in partnership with member stations like NET. Thanks to the many national and local partners supporting this project by helping youth across Nebraska and the country. We're looking forward to a great event and discussion on preventing youth suicide in Nebraska. You'll hear from a panel of Nebraska mental health professionals, as well as young adults sharing their personal stories of their mental health journey. Post your questions in the comments section of the NET News or the NET Nebraska Facebook page or the NET Nebraska YouTube page. Let us know your location as well as that question. First, we're going to hear from our PBS NewsHour student reporter, Corey McCowan in Omaha. And you're also going to see a few videos on why the topic of youth mental health is so important. Welcome to the Wellbeings Tour in Nebraska. We know that in one way or another, everyone has been affected by mental health challenges, and young people in our state are especially vulnerable. CDC research says suicide is a leading cause of death for 10 to 24 year olds in Nebraska. It's clear, we need to come together to find a way to help America's young people. Wellbeings is one way we can do this. This multimedia initiative created by WETA dives into the topic of youth mental health and centers young voices to raise awareness, address stigma, and create compassion on this issue. Here's an overview of the Wellbeings Initiative. The signature documentary series in the Wellbeings campaign is Ken Burns Presents, Hiding in Plain Sight, Our Mental Health Crisis. Produced and directed by Ewers Brothers Productions and written by David Blistein, the film will explore, through lived experiences, the youth mental health crisis in our country. Currently in production, this four-hour documentary film is slated to air on PBS stations in spring 2022. Wellbeings.org and hashtag Wellbeings will be adding content every week over the two years, including Brave Teens, where teen storytellers go on the record about their mental health journeys. And Brave High, a digital feature length documentary where students in high school productions share their mental health stories through spoken word, music and dance without fear, shame or stigma. Out of the Dark a short form digital series that will profile lives transformed by mental health challenges, highlighting the power of difference. PBS NewsHour's student reporting labs engage high school journalism students as correspondents that report on youth mental health from more than 150 high schools across 46 states. It's time to change the conversation about mental health. When you know something is wrong. When you feel alone. When you can't explain what hurts. When every day is a struggle. When you can't ask for help. When your friend or family member seems fine on the outside. But hurts on the inside. Sometimes I feel as though I'm the only one that feels. But I know that's not true. We can change. We, we can, can change. change. We can change. We can make a difference. There's power in our difference. We can support each other. We can fight stigma. We say it's okay. It's okay. It's okay to have a mental health condition. We all want to feel heard. To find hope. And to live in a world without stigma. Without discrimination. And we are a force to be reckoned with. I am not what happened to me. I am how I overcame it. Stand, Stand with, with us. us. And discrimination in mental health. You can see the person, not, not the condition. condition. You can build understanding. You can play your part. The conversation changes with me. With me. With me. We are well beings. We are all well beings.
Sometimes everything is wrong Now it's time to sing along When your day is night Hold on Hold on If you feel like letting go WETA, with a coalition of partners, welcomes you to the Wellbeing's Youth Mental Health Project. Hi, I'm Bill Pullman, and I'm honored to be with you as we launch this national campaign from public media. Wellbeing's is a groundbreaking project at a very important point in time. Mental illness disproportionately affects our young people and the most disadvantaged populations among us. The growing mental health movement has set the stage for dramatic change, to raise awareness, to reduce stigma, to focus on prevention and early intervention, and the promise of more research for new treatments. Together, we can bring mental illness and discrimination out of the shadows, and it's not a day too soon. So thank you for being here today. The We Are Wellbeings Story Wall is a central part of the wellbeings.org website, social media platform, and the Wellbeings National Tour. We are asking the public of all ages to submit personal reflections, videos, photos, and short stories to offer hope, to foster understanding, to build community, and break down stigma. What does being well mean to you? What is the one thing you wish people knew about mental health? What is your passion? What's your story? Video can easily be submitted via social media using the hashtag, hashtag wellbeings, or emailed to info at wellbeings.org. Stories can also be submitted by uploading to Dropbox and live at Wellbeings Tour events. The We Are Wellbeing Story Wall is made possible through generous support provided by Wellbeing's Youth Mental Health Project founding corporate sponsor, Otska, and Wellbeing's media partner, People.
Thanks again for joining us as part of this discussion on preventing youth suicide in Nebraska. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg, and I want to welcome everyone here to this discussion uh, over the course of uh, the next hour or so. We're going to be talking about suicide, about a very important topic to all of us and to this entire country. And we'll look at some of the trends and most importantly, we'll look at some solutions and some ways that you can help as well. If you do want to send us your questions or comments, you can do that through the NET News or NET Nebraska Facebook pages and also on the NET Nebraska YouTube page. And when you do that, if you'd like, let us know your location as well with your question. We have a very distinguished panel of guests with us as part of this discussion, and I want to introduce them to you at this point. Uh, welcoming Julie Hebenstreit is the executive director of the Kim Foundation in Omaha. That's an organization that offers support, resources, and compassion to those whose lives are touched by mental illness and suicide. Dr. Dave Myers is a suicidologist, a co-founder of the Nebraska State Suicide Prevention Coalition and Director of Behavioral Health Services at Bryan Medical Center in Lincoln. Miguel Estevez is a trilingual therapist at the Friendship House in Grand Island, using programs and therapy to help Nebraskans cope with traumatic events and mental conditions. And Saisha Adikira is the Executive Vice President of the Association of Students at the University of Nebraska. She's a senior at UNL, majoring in biology, psychology, and public health. Well, as we mentioned, this is a very important topic as a part of this discussion. And just to give you a little perspective and to set the framework for it, in Nebraska, suicide is the first leading cause of death for ages 10 to 14 years old. And it's the second leading cause of death for ages 15 to 24 years, years old. On average, one person dies by suicide every 32 hours, and more than four times as many people died by suicide than in alcohol-related motor vehicle accidents. In the year 2018, 271 people in Nebraska died by suicide. Those are the numbers, but we know that this is a very personal story. And so that's where we're going to begin with some of our panelists and their personal stories. I want to begin with you, Saisha, and uh, originally from Nepal. And you have uh, a story that includes uh, anxiety. And I want you to tell us just a little bit about what you faced and uh, how you've uh, worked through that. Yeah, so uh, I was born in Nepal and I moved to the United States when I was four years old. So as a young kid, I was already battling with an identity crisis. I didn't know how to assimilate into a new culture, but also obtain my roots. And I think that caused a lot of anxiety as a kid, but especially growing up and also having South Asian traditions kind of on me and weighing down my shoulders, that really alleviated my, um, that heightened my anxiety. And throughout high school and college, having to obtain these reputations and expectations of my culture and just my environment, I think is always taken a toll. And it's something I struggle with every day, but I have created solutions and steps and am working towards, it's not something that's just, okay, I'm better now, but it's very, it's a gradual process and um, I try every day, so. And being a senior in college, I'm sure there's no anxiety that you have these days, right? But as you look around on, oh, your, on, oh. on, yeah, <laughs> on your college campus, do you see that as being a real issue among your peers? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're on campus right now, but we don't know how longer, much longer we're going to be here because everything's changing. Um, nothing's really consistent. It seems like we wake up one day and the next day school will be canceled all, all over again. So students not knowing what's next is causing a lot of anxiety and our counseling and psychological services on campus they're really booked they have a ton of appointments because people are seeking help but it's just a college crisis right now that everyone's struggling together and we just don't know what's going to come next without a doubt we can all uh, feel for you with that as well uh, miguel estevez i want to talk with you a little bit about about uh your story as well, you're a therapist in Grand Island where you went to high school, I believe as well. And, uh, but as part of your background, as part of your life experience, you've dealt with extreme poverty and cultural identity and racism. Talk a little bit about how those things all came together uh, to provide some mental challenges for you. 
Yeah, so I actually was born in Anaheim, California, and actually lived there uh, for five years, uh, and then actually lived in El Salvador uh, slash Guatemala for a couple months uh, post Civil War in, in El Salvador. So my parents already had a, a tremendous amount of trauma, uh, particularly coming from a from a country of civil war. Uh, but then I moved back to California, then went back to Guatemala, actually lived in Guatemala for four years and, and really had an extreme amount of poverty and also adjusting to a new culture, uh, especially because I was, you know, grew up in California. Uh, but then you fast forward to leaving Guatemala, coming back, but in this case, coming to Grand Island, Nebraska. It was a culture shock for me. And, uh, you know, I was in ESL, ESL, trying to figure all of that out. And, uh, you know, I was uh, got in trouble a lot. I, I was sharing a lot of my mental health through through anger, uh, through coping in ways that weren't uh, well. And then fast forward to college, uh, I was a biology major as well and uh, trying to keep those grades up and, and having a tremendous amount of anxiety, uh, feeling like I, I had to carry the, the my community, uh, being one of the only uh, people of color, uh, only Latino uh, in my classes and, and realizing that, oh, okay, carrying all that. And then fast forward grad school, I, I uh, had a lot of suicide ideation uh, and really had to seek professional help. I actually had to leave Omaha for a year, came back to Grand Island where my mom was just really took care of me. Uh, and I just went to therapy and, and, and try to work on my own mental health. So I, I, I really took a year off um, after I was actually a, a PT student at UNMC. And uh, so then I had to put that in hold and came back. Uh, and obviously now I'm a therapist, not a PT. Um, so it really did affect me that I had to like take a year off uh, of just a, a lot of stuff. And, and those cultural barriers, the language barriers, how much does that play into the anxiety issue and the mental health issues that you see in the, the youth that you work with? And, and maybe answer us in English, but also if you have a message for our Spanish speaking audience, deliver that as well. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, even if English is hard, uh, especially us that grow up speaking two or three languages at home, uh, it, English can be hard and it can be, it keeps us shy, can make us uh, anxious whenever even speaking out loud or reading, uh, if you're in school reading out loud or, or if you're preparing for a speech or anything, uh, it really does cause some anxiety. And especially when you make that jump to college, uh, it feels very extreme, especially if, if English is really hard. So, um, so keep going that uh, English doesn't define you, uh, uh, you're learning. And even I still get nervous of my writing <laughs> in, in English and Spanish. I'm like, oh, I'm average at both, you know, uh, and stuff. And, and then in Spanish for, for the Spanish speakers uh, hearing, la salud uh, mental es importante y estoy agradecido que estás aquí uh, aprendiendo más um, eh, sobre este uh, tema. All right, thank you so much, Miguel. And Dr. David Myers, I want to bring you into the conversation at this point. You heard some of those numbers that we mentioned at the, the very beginning about uh, the prevalence of suicide among especially those very young uh, and, and the adolescents. Um, in your line of work, talk about that trend and talk about some of the things you think might have might be leading to that trend. Well, I think it's important for individuals to, to know that, you know, suicide is, is preventable, um, that, you know, we hear those numbers and they, you know, they do sound, you know, frightening that, uh, gosh, we have, um, you know, a high incidence of, of suicide in that age group. And, and individuals in that age group are going through a period of change, you know, a lot of changes in their life. And it's where they're, uh, I, I, you know, going through identity and uh, going to college and, you know, starting a new job. I mean, it's times where you think, well, gosh, that's those are exciting times, but those are also just as we heard uh, Saisha and, and uh, Miguel talk, talking about. I mean, it's the times of anxiety and, and, and times of, of uh, uh, just intense anxiety for some individuals. And those times where, where a lot of depression and uh, suicidal thoughts can set in. And so, you know, some of the statistics we didn't talk about were, uh, you know, on top of that, there's a lot of youth who have suicidal thoughts. So it is important that we do talk about suicide and get it out in the open and that um, to let folks know that there's hope, there's help and there's healing. And I think it's great. And I want to commend uh, Saisha and, and Miguel for uh, sharing their story, because what that does is that that opens the door for individuals to know that there's there's hope, there's help. You know, and there's healing out there that, you know, individuals, especially youth, oftentimes feel alone that, hey, I have 
these feelings um, that I'm going through and I feel like I'm the only one that has these feelings and I don't know what to do with them. But to hear others talk about their experiences and, and say, well, gosh, there's somebody else that's gone through this. There's somebody else that is going through this that I can talk to or it's OK to reach out for help. That opens the door and what, what that opens the door to is connectedness. And what we try to do, there's a lot of research out there that says connectedness is really the key to preventing suicide and preventing violence. You know, the more connected we are to our communities, the more connected we are to our family, the more connected we are to um, our friends and into school and all those things, the less likely it is that we're going to act out uh, towards ourselves or to others. And so that's what we can do is to help, try to help folks to be connected to their friends and their families and to their communities. And if we see somebody becoming isolated and doing some of the things that they uh, are not doing, some of the things that they normally do, then we need to start asking questions. You know, hey, are, are you suicidal? And to become comfortable asking that question. You know, are you suicidal? And to become comfortable talking about mental health and suicide. And I think that's what this whole program is about is for us to talk about that today. Very good, very good. Communication is so important. Uh, Julia Hebenstreit is the executive director of the Kim Foundation based out of Omaha. You give presentations uh, across the state of Nebraska, I'm sure, and beyond. Very uh, good organization that deals with those who have been touched by mental illness and suicide. Um, if you look at, we talked about those trends at the beginning and, and Nebraska in general, but uh, as far as this, the numbers for Omaha, uh, Sarpy County, uh, Douglas County. Uh, I believe you're looking at um, in 2020, just to give us some perspective, 40 suicides at this point so far, six of them with youth. Talk a little bit about the what you're seeing right right there in, in Omaha and, and in that surrounding area. Yeah, absolutely. So we do serve as a data collection source for suicide um, deaths that happen here in Omaha. And you mentioned that there are data comes from Omaha Police Department, SRB County Sheriff and Douglas County Sheriff. Um, and you mentioned the 40 suicides this year, but um, and that's 40 too many. But we also are encouraged because at this point last year we had 63. So our overall suicide deaths are down in our community. Unfortunately, as you mentioned, the youth suicides are higher than where we are, um, where we were last year at this time. And so it's important, you know, there's so much going on right now in our in our communities and, and across our country. And um, so it's hard to pinpoint why that's happening specifically. Um, but it's important that, as Dave said, we're having this conversation, we're bringing, out, bringing it out in the open, we're promoting help-seeking um, behavior in these young people. Um, and, and I think the other important piece to remember is we all play a role in suicide prevention. We can all make a difference in someone's life. We can all ask that question, um, support someone in their journey, and, and again, just start that conversation. I will echo many things that Dr. Meyer said in terms of commending um, our guests today who came out and told their stories, and that does just encourage others to connect and um, and open up and seek help and so we can't pinpoint again why we're seeing those numbers increase but we do know it's something we need to focus on as a community and make sure that we're connecting those who need it with help well as everyone has said telling these stories is so important to talk and to discuss about them we're going to be doing that throughout the course of of this program and uh Actually, more than half of all Americans are going to be diagnosed with a mental illness or a disorder at some point in their lifetime. That's according to the CDC. And today we are going to hear the mental health stories of young Nebraskans, starting with Caitlin Meadows. I've had anxiety like my entire life. Then in high school, I got diagnosed with anxiety, PTSD, and depression. So like for me, testing anxiety was a real thing in high school. Like it was awful. I also, I love talking to others. I love public speaking. I love sharing presentations. But for me, it was always that I wasn't going to do it right. I was very much fixated on what I was going to do wrong and never what I was going to do right. Um, I was never perfect enough. I was so fixate, fixated on the negatives that I couldn't see the positives, which also led to the depression as well. I felt like everybody else around me was enjoying their life much more than I was enjoying mine. 
I was realizing some things from my past that um, I hadn't learned how to deal with. I was abused as a child um, in different ways uh, by a family friend. And so it resulted in anxiety and PTSD. My mom never knew about that until um, I came out and told her about it. That was like a really hard thing for me. Like I didn't want to admit to anybody that I was what I was going through, but um, my um, friends and um, my boyfriend at the time uh, really helped me like tell my mom the things that I needed to tell her. Once we found the real problem, I guess, the underlying issue, um, that was very relieving for me because I was able to get the help that I needed. Of course, I had my support system. I had my friends, my family, and um, especially like my siblings and my parents. They were, they were great help for me. Um, but for me, I, I did go through therapy and um, I would sit and talk to my mom uh, during my therapy sessions and my siblings. And I also did a lot of dancing during that time. It was an outlet for me to express my emotion and I did theater and that really helped a lot as well. So I had all these things and then medication helped me get to that even better point and um, it helped everything that was going on in my mind kind of quiet down. <laughs> I have definitely come to the point where I know how to say what I need and how I'm feeling I've really found like my people that I can talk to about these things that I don't feel like they're going to judge me because that's another part of anxiety. You feel like everybody's going to judge you. And so it's hard to talk to your, about your anxiety with people that you think are going to judge you. My family has really been a crucial part of my life. I know that not everybody has that support. Not everybody gets that from their family, but I feel like everybody has somebody out there that can help them and that wants to help them. Really powerful story from Caitlin Meadows. Thanks, Caitlin, for sharing that as part of our well-being's tour preventing youth suicide in Nebraska from WETA and NET. Um, Miguel Estevez, I want to bring you in on this because as a therapist, one of the things that you specialize in is dealing with traumatic events and you deal with a lot of youth as well. So Caitlin shared that traumatic event that she went through and overcame. And uh, is that uh, is that something and what when you deal with someone who has been through that kind of traumatic event, what what do you tell them? What do you, how do you help them? Yeah. Yeah. And so grateful for her story and, and being vulnerable on camera. Uh, that's the biggest thing, being able to voice that with someone else, with a family member or a friend, that's a, that's a big, huge thing. Uh, and when you come to therapy, uh, a lot of my role as a therapist is to gain your trust, to be able to know that you can share uh, what's going on uh, because the healing that you're doing is not only uh, yourself, but you're healing from intergenerational trauma as she had shared. Um, and, and that's crucial. That's important. Um, and so gaining that trust. And, and she said that in the, in the video, I want to be heard and I don't want to feel judged. Uh, no matter what your mental health is, no matter what your problem is, no matter what you're struggling with, uh, the hope is that a society level and also individually and as a community, we can hear others and not be not judgmental. And that's the biggest thing that I try to do, to sit with you, to hear you and feel like you are not judged, that your problems matter and that your struggles do matter. Um, and I hope that as a community, um, for all of you tuning in, uh, that that's the biggest thing if you can take away uh, for our biggest prevention is uh, is hearing our youth, hearing our young adults, because uh, we just want to be heard, we want to be loved, we want to be connected. And that's one of the huge things that we can do that is preventative. Saisha Adhikare, uh, senior at UNL, do you feel heard? And do you feel as, do you feel most college students do? And do you feel as a college student that you know where to go if you do need, do need help, do need to reach out to somebody? 
Yeah, I think the tough thing is there are so many resources out there. And I like from personal experiences, when I was seeking therapy, I just didn't know where to start. Um, I could do a university, I could go to a provider, like, I didn't know where to go and how to start, how to get there, even making the phone first call, the first phone call. So I think I do feel heard at the university because everyone cares about our well-being, the university, the administrations, and they do a good job showing that. However, I think personally, it's just hard getting that first step to making the phone call or clicking on that website and booking an appointment. It's, it's that initial step. And I think that could be help with your friends and your family because for me, I didn't make the initial step. I had my friend do it for me. Um, and I think a lot of college students relate to that because it is, it is scary. And a lot of us, especially coming from my cultural background, therapy is not talked about at all. And kind of acknowledging, okay, I'm going to therapy is, is still different to me because I just started um, last semester. So it's quite new, but I feel so much better because of it. And I hope college students, especially those with a cultural background, also feel the same because it should be normalized. It should be talked about. And that's why I'm thankful for this. Julia Heben Stride of the Kim Foundation. A couple of questions that we have received in here through our uh, Facebook page um, that are somewhat related. I want to throw them out for discussion a little bit. Uh, one of them is any research demonstrating how to get youth to reach out for help when a friend tells them that they are attempting, since they often won't or don't want their friend to be mad, et cetera. And the other question from Kristen that's somewhat related is, when you're in that crisis, that moment of crisis situation, uh, does the does the medical language or is there language that they should focus on? What style of language should be used when trying to connect with a suicidal youth? Sure, I'll, I'll start with that first one. And I think, um, you know, we do speak all over the state, as you said, in schools and with youth and teachers and parents. And um, we often hear that, well, I don't want my friend to be mad at me. Um, you know, they disclosed this to me, they trusted me. Um, but what we always tell them, and it's kind of a harsh truth, but we would rather, you would rather have your friend here next week and mad at you than not here with you. And so while that's, you know, again, a harsh truth, it's very important for them to realize Realize. And the thing is, is most often the individual is grateful. Um, you know, it might take some time, but grateful that someone cared enough about them to get them the help that they needed. And so we just encourage people for youth, especially it's too much for them to take on their own. And so when we work with them, help them um, identify who is that trusted adult in your life. And I think too often we think it has to be the parent or it has to be the counselor at school. And really there's a lot of other people that they may come in contact with um, that could be that trusted adult for them. Is it a mentor? Is it a coach? Um, is it someone who is serving you lunch every day in the cafeteria? Is it, you know, a maintenance person at the school that you talk to in the hallway and feel trusted and, and heard? Um, so it's important to help them identify that network for themselves. Um, and then on, on the next uh, question that you asked, I think it's important, and, and Dr. Myers can touch on this as well, he already mentioned it's important to have that conversation and to ask those questions. It's a very difficult question to have um, or to ask, and it's not something that in our normal, you know, everyday conversation. And so even as, you know, we encourage people practice saying it in the mirror, practice saying it to each other, you know, because so when the time comes, you're comfortable enough to ask that question. And it's important to say, are you thinking of suicide? Are you thinking of dying? Um, and be very direct with the question. Um, there's a lot of uh, myth out there that it, if you ask the question, if you talk about suicide, then it puts the idea in their mind. And that has been proven um, to be just, just that, a myth and false. And it's important to ask those questions, have that conversation, provide that individual the outlet and connection to resources. Thanks, Julia. We do want to remind teens that there is a crisis text line. You can text hello to 741741. That's texting hello to 741741. Dr. Myers, uh, I'm sure you can build upon uh, what Julia mentioned as well, but we did have another question that came in to us through the NET News and NET Nebraska Facebook pages. Uh, and that is, is there really such a thing as stopping suicide ideation? Um, there, there is. Um, I mean, some individuals who are suicidal, um, they, they uh, you know, somebody says, you know, am I suicidal forever? And that, that's kind of a tricky question. And in, in most cases, individuals know you're not suicidal forever. Um, 
you know, some individuals may become suicidal now and, uh, you know, seek treatment and the suicidal ideation go away. But what we do know is that individuals who are suicidal now, their risk for becoming suicidal uh, is higher later in life. So they might have suicidal ideations again later in life, but that just becomes a risk factor in that list of risk factors that if they um, become depressed or anxious and so forth um, later in life, and if I was suicidal as a youth, I have a higher risk of becoming suicidal or having suicidal ideations as an adult. Um, we do know that about 90% of those who are suicidal um, or who have died by suicide had a, had a diagnosed mental illness. So I think it's important to point that out is that you know, mental illness um, is, a, uh, is a high risk factor. So not everybody with mental illness is suicidal, but the fact that somebody does have a mental illness um, is a risk factor uh, for individuals. So just a little bit more information about that, about that question. But yeah, suicidal ideation uh, does go away um, and there's various treatments. Um, in Caitlin's story, you know, I, I want to want to touch on that. She she touched on a couple things that I think were very important. Um, she talked about medication and therapy, and you know, so individuals who go in for treatment, you know, for some folks, therapy is what works, and that works great for them, and they don't need medication. Some folks go see a psychiatrist and and maybe don't go for therapy, and it's medication that works for them. But what research shows is that a combination of both of those things, therapy and medication together, folks find uh, relatively quicker results uh, with co combining both of those things. And I'm guessing that sometimes medication doesn't necessarily work right away, but if you're working with a, a doctor, and you're gonna find the right combination of medication that will help that particular person. Correct. Yeah. Uh, medication, uh, most medications take, uh, it takes a couple of weeks, you know, for the, for the psychiatrist or physician to be working with, with the individual to, you know, find the right dosage that works for you. But if, if, you know, if you and I were to go into the doctor and we both have the same symptoms, the medication that's prescribed for me might not work for you. And so that's what's sometimes frustrating for folks is finding that right medication. So it's really important that when you go in to work with a medication provider, is that you be patient and you have really good communication with that medication provider and let them know that, you know, I'm having these side effects. This is, you know, this is working well, this, this isn't working and continue to work with them and be patient until you find something that is working for you. Well, as we mentioned throughout the course of uh, our program today, Preventing Youth Suicide in Nebraska, we're going to be hearing the stories of youth from across Nebraska and how they've dealt with mental health challenges that they've faced. Let's hear now the story of 23-year-old Nebraskan Sam Bates. I was a very happy kid up until about third or fourth grade and I started to uh, gain a lot of weight. Um, by middle school, I was over 200 pounds. The, the bigger I got, the, uh, the more upset about it I got, the more jokes I got made at my expense. So therefore, the more, you know, the further I fell into that depression. That was sort of where my mental health journey began. About two years ago was when I was finally able to um, sort of lose weight more the healthy way and successfully keep it off for the last couple of years. But it still is something that I have to remind myself every day that you know weight doesn't define me and that what I look like is not the most important part about me. When I started sort of discovering my sexuality, I didn't know that bisexuality existed. Um, so I, I spent about a year convinced that I was uh, like clinically insane, that there was something wrong with me because I knew that there was straight and I knew that there was gay, um, but I didn't know that you could be both. I sort of did research on my own and discovered what bisexuality was and just felt this sort of overwhelming sense of like knowing who I was all of a sudden. I was very good at uh, hiding my feelings and hiding sort of my depression and all the struggles with my identity. Um, so I actually started therapy because my mom took me because she thought I had ADD. And so I continued therapy on and off 
throughout middle school and high school. Um, I was on um, antidepressants for a few years and then have been sort of on and off of them since then. Being in therapy was a huge help for me. Um, being really involved in extracurriculars in high school was definitely um, a huge thing because I had friends in middle school, but I didn't really have like a core group of people that had a shared interest. And so when I started doing theater, um, it's just opened up this whole world and this whole family that I didn't know was out there. They sort of became my go-to people whenever I was going through something. So that's basically where I'm at now. It's just very much still sort of struggling with my sense of identity and with my body image, but I've definitely come a long way from sort of the formative years that really uh, sort of took a toll on me. My journey has definitely been sort of up and down. Um, but over the past few years, I think just um, really focusing on myself and sort of learning to let go of the outside world sometimes. You can't control whether people like you, you can't control whether people are homophobic, you can't control whether so-and-so, like you, you have to focus on yourself, you can't take it personally. Just because you have bad days doesn't mean that those good days don't exist. And I'm definitely a living testament to that and very much appreciate that um, I didn't end things because I would have missed out on a lot of good experiences that I've had over the last 10 years or so. And um, I'm definitely grateful. That's the story of Sam Bates, and uh, Sam is someone who, as you heard, dealt with weight-related depression and also maybe some confusion over his bisexuality. Uh, I want to bring Julia Hebenstraight uh, uh, back into the uh, conversation from the Kim Foundation in Omaha. And Julia, you talked to a lot of youth groups. Uh, kids are dealing with a lot of things, uh, right? And there's a lot of pressure in that particular age group. One of the thing, what are the things that you can say to them, to, that you reach out to them to try to uh, help them understand that, as, as Sam mentioned, that the journey is going to have up and downs, but he's really glad he didn't end things. And I think you may be on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's OK. Um one thing I took note of um, with, that Sam said there at the end was just because you have bad days doesn't mean that the good days don't exist. I love that. And just that message of, um, you know, hope that that provides for people. And that's what we try and do for youth is, um, is bring that message of hope and teach them how, yes, these things are going to happen. You are going to be facing a lot, but how can we build healthy coping, me healthy coping mechanisms into your, um, you know, kind of your tool belt and how can, and we, so we teach them what those are, whether that's um, you know, he talked about acting and extracurriculars, and it might be journaling, it might be playing music, listening to music, um, physical exercise. And we even, with some youth, will build calm kits and different things that they can use in their day to day um, to, to really bring that anxiety down. But most importantly, always teaching them to reach out for help. We can't say that enough. Um, those help seeking behaviors and, and the hope um, piece of it is the most important. And so I think, you know, just letting them know they're never alone in this, that there is help out there. But, you know, as we had already talked about, sometimes that's the hardest step is that first step asking for help and reaching out. And so giving them different avenues that they can do that, helping them identify in their schools, this is who you could reach out to. These are the resources resources available to you, um, you know, and other community resources. You already mentioned the text line and the suicide lifeline um, and providing them just the, the freedom to know that it's OK that they reach out and do that and that they're not alone in that. And you mentioned that text line. I'll tell you again, the text line, just text hello to 741-741. Dr. Myers building again off of, of what uh, Julia said, um, you know, we see that uh, certain, or I, let me ask you, are there certain groups, certain individuals, uh, whether it's LGBTQ or other groups of students that are more vulnerable to these kind of thoughts, to, to mental illness, mental stress? 
Yeah, um, I mean, there's some research that shows that LGBTQ are, are more vul vulnerable. Um, we do know that, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, individuals who have a predisposed, uh, you know, mental illness, so, you know, individuals that already are struggling with depression and anxiety as an adolescent, um, you know, individuals who are uh, already going through some bullying, um, uh, individuals who've gone through a, a break up with a boyfriend, girlfriend. Um, we do know that, that youth who um, are, are going through, you know, a rough time and they're, they're very impulsive and, um, you know, suicide is an impulsive act and uh, youth are, are, are very impulsive. And so we really need to uh, really uh, teach youth those coping skills and to really connect those youth to those the support systems. And, you know, Julie had mentioned, um, you know, uh, well, had talked, you know, earlier when we were talking about, um, you know, connections within the school. And there's such thing as called hope squads, but there's also things that I, what I was wanted to mention is called wellness recovery action plans for youth. And I think it's important for youth to know that uh, connecting youth with other youth is is really important so you know a youth who knows that there's another youth that's struggling that they can connect with them you know the schools are connecting uh, s scenarios up with um, situ situations such as hope squads knowing that um, a hope squad is is where uh, a youth who is having suicidal thoughts and maybe somebody who is vulnerable knows that there's a youth that's that uh, is the person i need to reach out to um in that school who can connect me with somebody to help me if i'm suicidal um in the community there's what we call wellness recovery action plan groups and they're called peer specialists and they have those groups for youth as well and so it's important for individuals listening in that they you know to look to reach out to their regions and to find out if there's a peer group available in their region for youth because you know youth who develop a wellness plan have, have really found success with uh helping with their mental with their mental health moving forward and along those lines abby on facebook writes in and says the rates of suicide among lgbtq plus youth is higher uh, but studies show that supportive, inclusive adults can impact this as a state. How do we create a more inclusive culture for LGBTQ youth? And I think you kind of touched on that a little bit, Dr. Yeah. Myers. But. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think we need to, um, you know, to be to be to be inclusive um, is to, to build those, you know, to build those connections. And kind of what we're finding with, uh, you know, with the technology is that we're finding with. To be inclusive with everybody is that what we're finding is that with technologies, everybody's moving towards. Um, we're not seeing a whole lot of, you know, activity with teens talking to teens, and we're face to face, and that's really what we need to to, to try to move towards is to get those connections face to face. We're seeing a lot of connections via the Instagrams and the different connections that way. And that can be positive, and that but that can be negative too. And so one thing that we're trying to do, uh, or that we are doing here in Nebraska, the Nebraska State Suicide Prevention Coalition is in the process of developing a phone app, and it's called uh, it's going to be called the My Companion app. And so what this app is going to be able to do is we're going to make this available statewide for all youth, and they can download this app, and it allows them. To do some journaling on the app, but then it allows them to build in connections with youth that they trust, and then they can reach out to those youth and to talk to those youth. So, if a LGBTQ um, a youth wants to build some, we call them allies, youth that they can trust um, to be inclusive, or if there's a, a, you know a, another youth that finds a, another other youth that has the similar interests um, that they can start building those connections statewide. And it also will have the 1-800-273-8255 connections in it. And it's uh, it's modeled after a couple other states 
suicide prevention apps that have been very successful. Another group I want to I want to specifically talk about is immigrants and refugees, and I know both uh, Saisha and Miguel, you've uh, dealt in particular and talked to groups of Im immigrants and refugees. Um, Miguel, let's start with you. Um, how specific is this issue for that particular group? Yeah, so uh, there's a there's a thing called epigenetics, and what epigenetics is saying is how does your uh, your DNA not necessarily changes, but it manifests itself in a different way. Uh, and what epigenetics comes from is, is from in, intergenerational trauma. Uh, and if we know from uh, uh, people from the global south, uh, like Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, um, either refugees or immigrants, uh, there's a tremendous amount of trauma that has happened there. Uh, we can start with, with uh, civil wars, we can talk with extreme poverty, we can talk about um, um, well, other things like uh, machismo, which is like patriarchal like systems of hurting women, uh, there's sexual trauma, uh, and all this has gone uh, for centuries. We can go to back to col colonization and slavery uh, for a long time, and all this has passed on uh, through that. So a lot of them come with these needs, uh, and if we go to Maslow's hierarchy, uh, you know, a lot of the times the reason they're not seeking mental health is because food and shelter is the most important thing right now but at some point at some time uh they're in a safer environment especially here in nebraska we do have uh the opportunity to have a a, a little bit more economically more stable uh that they start getting uh, a little bit better economically uh and some of that mental health starts to to shift uh part of the reason is because they're not in survival mode anymore uh and stuff like that and that can truly affect the refugee community and the immigrant community um i've had the opportunity to work with uh with a lot of the karen and karani community uh, when I was living in Omaha, and uh, we just saw a lot of suicide happening, uh, and and the Korean community and Korean, uh, Korean and Korean community are very close, very uh, together. But uh, the the teenagers and the youth just felt like they couldn't express themselves anymore, uh, and I think that's one of the bigger shifts uh, uh, in the immigrant refugee communities, feeling like okay, my parents are telling me tough it out, we're in a better country, deal with it. Uh, but then in school, I'm like, oh, express your feelings. So uh, it's this uh, dissonance of like, I can't really tell my parents I feel this type of way because they don't believe in mental health. But then my friends don't believe it either. But the community and the societal level is telling me to express myself. So they're getting very confused, right? Uh, and then that's what leads you to loneliness. And we see that loneliness uh, it can be a symptom of depression, but loneliness is loneliness. And, and as we see, uh, uh, because of COVID-19, we see that uh, we see how important uh, to interact socially uh, it is. Uh, and, and loneliness really, really, uh, really affects your mental health and, uh, and it can be a uh, kind of a preventative way if we can work through loneliness um, because as you interact with other people, you create neurogenesis and you create other people that, uh, and, and your brain is plastic so you can make those connections and know that you're safe uh, and, and that's kind of the bigger thing and the biggest shift, especially in immigrant refugee community. And also going to a therapist or a social worker that kind of looks like you, that's huge. And that was part of the reason why I chose this career, feeling like, oh, he understands me. He understands what it looked like to maybe cross borders or, you know, leave a whole other continent or, or start a new language or start a new uh, uh, cultural identity. What does it look like for me to interact with the society, but at the same time, uh, home looks completely different, but at school looks completely different, or in college looks different. There's different values. What are what are the values that I I want to keep, and what are the values that I want to add on and and create my own identity? And, and that's very very like scary, uh, especially in the times of youth and and young adults because they're in that identity trying to find that it, it's either ethnic identity or like Sam identity uh, and as the LGBTQ plus and your sexual orientation. Uh, it really is. And uh, Saishi, uh, I'm sorry, Saisha uh, Adhikari, I want to bring you in on this too, because you have talked and worked with refugees who have been resettled in the Omaha area. Talk about an overwhelming experience and uh, talk a little bit about what are the coping mechanisms that you talk to them about. Yeah, so I am a public health educator for newly settled refugees. And I think the biggest thing I've noticed is Uh, Saisha, I think you may have hit mute, maybe. Saisha, did you don't did, did you mute yourself by chance or? I did not mute myself. No, there you go. Now we can hear you. Go ahead. 
Um, as I was saying, I think the biggest thing that I see in the refugees is how much they want to assimilate to the American culture. And what I tell them is, you don't have to. We need to embrace our differences here, our diverse perspectives and backgrounds. And because that's a gift here, that's, that's why the society functions so great is with all these great voices and diverse experiences. Um, so that's one of the coping me mechanisms I tell them is embrace your culture. I don't want you to assimilate to the English language and culture and the healthcare here. Let's make this relate back to your own cultures and your roots so you understand this better. Um, and that's what I struggled with as well coming here. And I 100% agree with what Miguel was saying about you have your culture saying, no, don't talk about feelings, but then you come to school and then it's all about feelings. So that's, that's definitely the boundary there. And I, that's how I tell my refugees is, I said, this is a safe space. I am a woman of color. I feel you, um, let's talk about this together. That's great advice. You know, mental illness symptoms can emerge maybe if you're in your mid twenties, but they often appear even in grade school children. Right now we're gonna hear from Mar Lee who grew up in a small town Alma in central Nebraska. I have been struggling with mental illness for, I guess like 10 or 11 was when I first started having issues with anxiety um, and having panic attacks. And I started kind of struggling when I was about 12 with depression and having suicidal ideation and started self-harming um, around that age. There was this time when actually I was studying abroad the summer after my freshman year of college um, and I was sexually assaulted when I was there and my first impulse was I just had so much of the self-hatred and blame and guilt of what had happened that I wanted to self-harm again. Tattoos actually um, became like a different way that like I was experiencing like the pain but it was in a way that was creating art. The whole idea of like a semicolon as a sentence is where you could put a period, but you don't, you continue the sentence. For me, it's representative then instead of like ending my life when I could have, because um, I have survived through like two suicide attempts from when I was like 16. I was depressed. I didn't have a reason to live. I didn't see a point. And for me, it was like, I got this tattoo when I was 18 and it was just kind of the symbol of wow, I made it to 18. I didn't think I was gonna live this long. I mean, I grew up in Alma, it's a rural area. So to get to a counseling appointment, it would be like an hour round trip um, to be able to go and see a counselor. The accessibility of counseling and the specific type of counseling that I needed wasn't available. Probably like in my freshman year of college, I decided to go see a counselor at UNL. It was actually through that that I was able to get other diagnoses to treat things like finding out that I had borderline personality disorder or figuring out that I was suffering not just from anxiety, but also this was PTSD that I was experiencing. I have made so much progress in the last year and a half thanks to doing this kind of therapy it's something that's really changed my life a lot Uh, Mar Lee, who prefers the pronouns they, them, uh, her story um, and a very power, or excuse me, they, their story, very powerful story as well. And I want to start with Miguel. Uh, as we talk about um, youth who are in rural areas and you deal with some of that, even though you're in Grand Island, there's, um, you know, Alma is a, a community that's that's close by or, in, you know, in central Nebraska. Um, yeah, how much does that play into it? Are the resources there for these youth that are in uh, in rural areas of the state? Yeah, it's a, it's a huge problem that we have in, in Nebraska. Uh, that was part of the reason why I actually moved to Grand Island to try to be close to West. Uh, I had a lot of opportunities to stay in Omaha and I love Omaha, that's where all my friends are at. But realizing that there's a big need uh, in Grand Island and the Tri-City area is growing, but if you go even westward uh, or north or, or, uh, or south, there just isn't a lot of mental health uh, therapists in general, but then the accessibility of finding a psychiatrist for medication uh, or MD or a medication specialist, uh, you add that additional thing. Um, so yeah, some students uh, or some uh, youth have to drive an hour 
uh, like they did, uh, they had to do. And, uh, and I think that's why it's important to uh, not only invest in, in telehealth as uh, uh, COVID-19 actually forced a lot of those therapists to go to telehealth, but now we're seeing some of the greatest things. I actually been seeing a couple, a couple of people in North Platte and Lexington and other places that I would, would have never had the opportunity to do. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think investing in, in Nebraska and, and, and telehealth is a big thing, but also encouraging a lot of our young adults uh, that are mental health professionals to go west, uh, we need our help. We need you. Uh, the, I took that big step to come out uh, to Grand Island, uh, and we can really make our, our community uh, better. That's a great commitment, uh, Dr. Myers. Uh, how do you think Nebraska's treatment desert, so to speak, are being addressed? Uh, yeah, Miguel touched. Uh, he was right on. Um, you know, COVID nineteen has uh, you know has provided some benefit in terms of the telehealth um, that has opened the doors for individuals out in the western Nebraska who w before had to drive hours for for treatment and now um, can turn on the computer and, and connect to a, a therapist uh, but if they have you know broadband connection um, the other piece is that, you know, as Miguel mentioned, there is a very uh, large shortage of, of mental health, health therapists uh, across Nebraska, out in western uh, Nebraska. And so we do have an initiative here in Nebraska um, through the uh, Behavioral Health Education Center of Nebraska, which is located in Omaha, but they're trying to educate various mental health and substance abuse providers across the state and to help get folks placed in the smaller communities. So if there's folks out there that have, a, have an interest in the behavioral health sciences, um, I mean, it's a, it's a great, great profession and, and to get folks out there in those communities, um, we definitely could use, could use you. Julia Hebenstreit, um, one of the questions that we received from Dory and Lincoln on YouTube, on the NET Nebraska YouTube page, uh, wants to know about the impact of screen time versus person-to-person -person contact for our young people. Is there a correlation to technology use that we're seeing in the in the research? Youth that are always on their cell phones or on social media. Do, or, do we think that that plays into some of these contributing factors? Yeah, I think it definitely um, contributes to to it on a, a number of levels. I think just technology in general. You know, the generations before didn't have. They couldn't just Google um, anything they wanted and information would pop up. They didn't have um, as much access to violence as as we as our youth have now. Um, but and 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 Dr. Myers touched on this. They're connecting through their devices and through social media um, and technology, but not necessarily that interpersonal connection face to face. And I think we've lost a lot of that. And it's important to remind people you know, why we need to do that, how to support each other and how to be there for each other, you know, face to face. Yes, technology is easier for some and it serves its purpose, but there's so much to be said about that personal connection for people. Um, and, and I think there's, you know, there hasn't been enough research done yet for us to say exactly um, what impact technology and social media has had on suicide rates or mental health. We know it plays a role in it um, and it can play for some a significant role. So that's that's um, important to note. I did want to quickly too, when you talked about the rural um, access and care, I just want to make sure Dr. Myers touched on this before about the regions that Nebraska is split into six behavioral health regions and each region has a regional office that you could see you could reach out to and connect um, they can connect you to the resources you need. So just find out, there's a map on our website, actually the kimfoundation.org, that you can find your town and what region you're in. And Saisha, I wanna go back a little bit to the technology question too, because you're on a college campus. And if you walk down a college campus, you'll uh, see a lot of students with their head down and looking at that at that cell phone and social media is a very important uh, part of, of, of the, the lives of a, uh, the life of a college student. So uh, how do you see that issue as playing into anxiety and stress and uh, mental illness in, in some form or another? Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, social media is huge on college campuses. It's everything all the time. Everything's on social media, communication channels, 
Um, we always use Google Docs and Google Forms. You know, everything is on social media nowadays. But I think something that I've seen, especially in student government, where these are leaders on campus, is how some people feel the imposter syndrome and how maybe they doubt their achievements. And because we're with all the student leaders and they say, oh, my goodness, like this person just got this award and they got into this honor society. And that's the culture I see in student government, but also other leaders across campus. And the reason for that is because they're posting about these achievements. So we see this, we doubt our own achievements and successes, and that creates kind of competition in a way and self-doubt and kind of thinking maybe you're not worthy of it, achieving similar successes. So that's why I think in those cases, self-love is huge there because people aren't posting their failures. They're only posting what they accomplished. So as student leaders, leaders especially, I think we need to normalize kind of we have our faults and failures and our flaws is what makes us human beings. It's not our successes and achievements. Julia, I got to ask you, because as I'm watching you, as you listen to Saisha talk, you're shaking your head. Yes, that's something that <laughs> you're saying is definitely uh, an issue, right? Yeah. And I think, too, you know, she touched on that. It's like people are only posting the good. And so it's creating anxiety. And, and two, you know, they get into how many likes do I have? How many shares do I have? How You know, and it's just you never turn it off. And so that's, you know, one thing that we didn't have growing up, you know, we could easily turn off when we left school or left, you know, what whatever it was. And now it's just constantly with them. And so it's important to to help people understand that, you know, as she said, everyone has their flaws, everyone has, you know, makes mistakes. That's not what they're posting, but it's important to embrace that side too. Yeah, so, can I jump in here? Too? Yeah, you bet. Go ahead, Miguel. I was just gonna come to you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think Instagram really, really messes up. Uh, me being a young adult as well, uh, it really uh, adds to body shaming and a lot of uh, uh, on like us. Uh, and I think that's where a lot of the problems have been. We A lot of people use filters. A lot of people only post the best pictures, best angles, all this other stuff. And that adds into uh, body shaming. Uh, that like particular jumps into, you know, some uh, uh, eating disorders for men and women. Uh, and I think Instagram really, really kind of, and I think us youth, uh, and younger adults, we know, oh, it's just a, a filter. But somehow we still believe, oh, but I want to do that. You know, I want to look like that. Even though we know that, like, it doesn't look like that. And, and we, in our head, cognitively understand it. But when we're always, like, you know, sliding and you're like, oh, that person's good looking. That person's good looking. That person's uh, doing so well. They're healthy. Well, look at all those successes. It, like, does something to you because you're always looking at all people's successes and not, you know, people are not being vulnerable, being like, hey, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. And I think that pushes us further to isolations uh, in terms, and that adds, that's kind of where suicide jumps in, where we're feeling like, oh, everybody's being successful and I'm not. So Dr. Myers, let me take it a step further then. Would you say that heavy use of technology or heavy use of social media could potentially be a red flag that parents and friends should be concerned about? Yeah, I think there definitely needs to be limits placed on the use of, of social media. Um, you know, there there are definitely pros and cons to social media. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of therapists use social media as part of part of treatment, as far as like some different apps for, you know, relaxation and those types of things. But as far as uh, you know, cause a lot of youth obviously are doing gaming and. Um, on, on the different uh, social sites and connecting with their with their friends and so forth. But it impacts your sleep, obviously. And if you're on it all the time, I mean, with, with, when we're talking about good mental health, you know, sleep is very important. And I always call it the big three. You know, you got to have good sleep, uh, eating well, and making sure that you're getting some type of exercise. But sleep is very, very important. If we don't have good sleep, we're not concentrating, um, we're not functioning, you know, adequately, and that's really going to affect our mental health all the way around. And so that's why it's important to really for parents to really set some limits on that social media. And I know that can be really hard. It's easy, you know, for for us as professionals to say, "Hey, set those limits," but it's important that you that you really do that. That's yeah, that's good advice. And. Of course, all throughout this program, we've been sharing the mental health stories of young Nebraskans. And Brandon Andretti grew up in the foster care system. And here's his story. My name is Brandon Andretti. I'm 23. Um, I live in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, I love music and art. 
uh, dancing, singing, riding, skateboarding. I'd say uh, I experience depression and anxiety. I've always had a therapist and I've always been on medicine until I was 19. And I've just, like I said, I've just known I've always been this kid with the problem. It's different when you go into it at such a young age. It's like this thing that's just a part of your life. You, it makes you feel like it, you have like a problem that's not normal and you're not you're different from other people because of it because when i was a kid like you don't really know who you are you know what i'm saying and then you have this this medicine and then they ask you monthly how do you feel anything change anything different i always say i don't know like how am i supposed to feel i felt like i was like existent but i wasn't living you know when i turned 19 they told me i had the choice to stop taking them and i stopped taking them from me being through all that I've been through, it's like you have a, a guard and I'm, I'm trying everything that I can in every situation that I do to not get hurt and to not become sad. Life can just seem so dark. Your head can get so dark sometimes and just a simple smile, a simple act of love can really change somebody's day. I've experienced it, it's true. I just wanna say life's worth living. It really is. Your happiness will come one day. Just please don't give them. Life is worth living. Please don't give up. What an awesome message from Brandon Andretti. And thank you so much uh, to all of those who are sharing their stories with us throughout this uh, this program, part of the Wellbeings Tour, brought to you by WETA and NET, Preventing Youth Suicide in Nebraska. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Remind you that that text line, you just need to text hello to 741-741. And the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number is 800-273-TALK. So um, a pretty powerful story there. And uh, Julia, I want to toss a question to you. We sometimes hear that suicide deaths are a surprise to friends and family who say their loved one's actions kind of came out of nowhere. But there seem to always be some kind of warning signs that are out there somewhere. Uh, maybe talking about feeling hopeless or being a burden to others, sleeping too much or too little, as Dr. Myers pointed out, isolating from family and friends. What do you see as some of the most important warning signs to look for? Yeah, and you do hear that, you know, that they didn't see it coming and that it was a surprise. Typically, we work with a lot of suicide survivors and in suicide, a survivor is someone who's lost a loved one to suicide. Typically, as they get to a point in their grief um, where they're in a, a healthier spot, they they will say, oh, I, I guess I should have noticed this or this did happen. I just didn't realize it was a sign at the time. And that's why it's very important to empower people with the knowledge of what those warning signs are and what to look for. Um, and so some of those, you know, you did touch on them. It really comes down to a change in the individual's pattern of behavior. So sleeping too much, sleeping too little, um, isolating themselves, withdrawing from activities that they previously Previously enjoyed. Um, you know, the one thing that we struggle with is, especially with youth, this is a very transformational time in their life and they may be figuring out who they are. And so it's, you know, you kind of have to watch for not just necessarily, oh, they don't want to play soccer anymore, but they don't want to play soccer anymore. They haven't entirely, you know, they're not connecting with their friends or not going to their youth group at the church anymore. So look for some of that overlap. Um, also, you know, that sense of hopelessness and, um, you, you know, you said that like life just isn't worth living anymore. You'll hear that sometimes and it comes out many different ways, but the overall sense of, um, you know, worthlessness and hopelessness. You also sometimes find um, people giving away uh, possessions that were important to them because they no longer feel like they need them and they entrust, you know, a friend or family member with whatever that item may be um you, you know you may see them posting things on social media and you know or talking about dying it doesn't necessarily have to be their death or researching ways to do that and so it's important to monitor especially as a parent monitor um, their internet use and, and what's happening and what they're posting about the one nice thing about social um, a lot of the social media 
um, outlets is that most all have a reporting mechanism within the site. So if someone posts something that you're concerned about, um, that you know you can flag that and they will receive a message with a suicide lifeline on there and someone from the social media, um, whatever that, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is, um, will connect with them in some way. And so that's important too. And I just, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to for people to know the warning signs and know what to look for because that's the biggest way and the best way to prevent suicide. Yeah, if I can, uh, this is David, uh, just to tag on to what Julie was saying, um, you know, that, that's right on. And and uh, oftentimes I've heard parents also, um, you know, I've, I've done a lot of research in my career with with parents uh, who unfortunately have lost a child to, to suicide. And when, you know, one of the things that I've, I've heard a lot is, you know, the things that Julia has said, you know, as parents will, will say that, well, you know, I thought it was just a phase or, um, you know, that this is maybe what they were supposed to be going through at this point in time in their life. And it's it's always important that if, if you see or hear any of those things that Julia mentioned, any of those warning signs that, you know, you do ask that question of your youth, you know, never be afraid to ask that question. Are you thinking about suicide? And um, and to not show shock or disapproval if, if they say yes. And um, to let them know that, oh, okay, well, let's talk more about that. And to try to understand the pain that they're going through. Because if they say yes, that means that they're going through some type of psychological pain. And to let them know that, okay, oh, I'm gonna try to, I, I wanna get you some help but let's talk about what you're going through. And Sasha from, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Julia. Oh, no, I was just going to add exactly what Dave said in terms of, you know, I am a, a parent of a teenager, as is he. Um, and so one thing I always point out to people is, you know, yes, have those lines of communication open, but not when you're comfortable or ready to talk. Do it when they are ready to talk because those might be two different times. Um, and so even if it's at 1030 and they're just getting home from whatever activity or a friend's house and, you know, and they want to come and talk to you then and you're tired and you have a big meeting in the morning, you know, you're never going to regret having that conversation. So talk to them on their time, not yours. Yeah, very, very good point. And Sasha, I was just going to bring you in again from the perspective of a college student, knowing some of these warning signs. Do you have anything to add to that? Or do you find yourself, you know, noticing or looking for those warning signs in, in your own friends and, and the people you're around? Yeah, um, for me, I've always asked the circle around me who are also leaders on campus how they are, because I think being being leaders and being overachievers especially and i'm a stem major as well so in that major specifically everyone seems to be on top of it and you question is this just is this just a facade they're throwing are they are they really okay it's just a face they're putting on to get through it and pretend like they're okay so it's those people who are always happy all the time it's those people that i ask are you okay and a lot of times when i ask my friends that they say actually, no, I'm not okay. I, this is just a face I put to get me through the day. And I think that's something I've been looking for in college students. And that's one of the warning signs I see is students who see students who are expected to be on top of things. Usually when you ask them, there's something that they're struggling with. And that is the case usually. So Miguel, we've heard that communication is so important and having those conversations and reaching out to somebody if you feel like they're in trouble. How easy is that, do you think, for in particular youth to do, the youth that you work with, to, to have that conversation, to start it? Yeah, it's it, it's hard, uh, especially because they just don't know what to say or they don't know uh, what they're feeling. Uh, and I think there's a, a jumping into that shift. There, sometimes there's a shift uh, in suicide when you know they're very alone, very, very they don't want to talk to anybody and then out of nowhere, they start kind of showing all these symptoms of being okay. And I think that's where we have to be really careful, uh, especially uh, the people that have uh, died of suicide. Uh, usually that's a, a big sign that they uh, they feel like their life is ready to be done. So then they're like enjoying their last days. And I think that's really important. So never underestimate 
like the shift of moods. Uh, I know the teenagers, it's like their moods are always changing, but it's important to always be involved. Uh, and I think as, as, as youth and teenagers, uh, I think the more we talk about it, just like we are today, the more we know I can seek help, just like Brandon did. Like I can talk to someone, I can, I can conversate about this. Uh, I can, uh, can, someone can just hear me and just, that's all I need. Uh, and I think that's what, that's where as a societal level we need to go. And, and I think uh, jumping into the, the hustle, the go, 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 go. I think a lot of these youth or college students are, are so used to going, 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 that they don't know how to pause and they don't know how to, okay, what's going on? What am I feeling? What, what am I feeling anxious about? What am I feeling scared about? And at that point, they don't really kind of have that verbiage. They can say, I feel bad or I feel sad, but they don't have quite that verbiage. And I think it's important uh, as us as, as, uh, adults and, and as a community to model what it feels to be like, I feel sad. I feel disappointed. I feel frustrated. I feel exhausted. Uh, for them to practice those languages so then they can come to you, either if you're a football coach or soccer coach or, or teacher or uh, youth leader or whoever, they can communicate. And we can see the patterns in youth and we can be like, is it, uh, how are you feeling? You know, instead of them saying, I don't know, they, they can actually say, I feel sad or I feel disappointed or I feel scared or I feel feared. And that's huge, just having that verbiage of saying, this is how I feel. And that goes above and beyond. Yeah, that's that's a great point because we want youth and, and anybody who's feeling those kinds of feelings, stress and anxiety, and, and we want them to verbalize, but it's also important for family and friends to listen and to, to make themselves available. And uh, Jaden Rowe is involved in student government at UNL, and uh, he helped to start a new program that's aiming to raise awareness of mental illness and the available resources on campus. So the Green Bandana Project was a project that was started in Madison, Wisconsin, and it was centered around being a device to open up to talk about mental health awareness and provide a system where students in need had a safe way to go and speak and get resources on mental health resources. And you'll see them all around campus on people's backpacks. And what it means is that you are an advocate for mental health. It does not mean that you're a mental health professional. It just means that you're able to connect people in need to those mental health professionals to begin that talk and open up that change for students. And so we had the idea of kicking it off very big at one of the Husker basketball games. I believe it was against Michigan. At that basketball game, I think we gave out over a thousand green bandanas, a thousand resource cards. Most students are either away from home or they're on their own for the first time. A lot of the new things that students get involved into can be very scary. Um, academics are very scary, future is very scary, and a lot of times that overwhelms a lot of students. You can kind of find yourself not knowing where to go, not know who to get involved with, not know where those resources are. And so for us, it's extremely important to bring those resources to light and make sure that students know, hey, these are places that you can go, safe environments to seek help if you need it. I think I speak from a very privileged standpoint of I'm involved in a lot of um, these very cool um, organizations on campus, but that doesn't exclude me from suffering from some of these things. I was in an extremely um, kind of tedious course load, a lot of things happening on the ASUN backside, my other involvements, and so it can get very overwhelming, and it did for me. A lot of times you find that mental health is frowned upon, um, depression, anxiety, all of this, it's kind of looked at of, well, you're not strong enough, but that's actually not the case. The Green Bandana Project, I think, has done a great job at destigmatizing that talk where it's showing that students care about students. We care about change in our own state. We care about change for those around us. And um, we've been seeing those talks start to begin with administration and really around the world. Saisha Adhikari, a senior at UNL, the Green Bandana Project is on your campus. Tell us how effective you think it is and, and how effective is that approach to your fellow students? Yeah, I mean, I as Jaden said, the Green Bandana Project, it, it was really successful. I was really surprised as well. I was at that basketball game and everyone was like, oh, Green Bandana, Green, green Bandana, that's interesting. What's that for? Because it's a sea of red and all of a sudden you have greens here and there. Um, but I think it really brought the campus together, especially on the topic of mental health and raising awareness for this important cause. 
because if we want to destigmatize mental health, then we have to talk about it and we have to raise awareness so it's normalized on campus. And just walking around and seeing everyone having their backpacks, it it really encourages everyone else to put it because in college, if one person does something, then usually you get a group or two doing the same thing. So it just became this wide effect. And I hope that it happens this year again. And um, I have one in my backpack right now. So I, I was really excited to see how successful it was. And I just hope we keep pushing for these mental health resources because this is also a kind of call to action for administration to say, hey, look, these are how many students support mental health initiatives. So we want to work with the administration to get more on campus. And Dr. Myers, uh, you talked before about connectedness, and I think this is part of that, that, that listening, that being there for that other person. You're also involved with the LOSS teams, L-O-S-S -S teams, which connects recent suicide survivors, and by that I mean people who have lost, lost a loved one who has died by suicide, uh, and connecting them with another survivor. Is that, talk about that connectedness in that program and just in general and how important that is. Yeah, LOSS is, uh, stands for Local Outreach to Suicide Survivors, and it's a, a concept that we started. Uh, we started as a pilot project here in Lincoln um, about 11 years ago, and since then we have uh, expanded it statewide. Um, we have nine teams now across the state, and uh, Julia, um, the Kim Foundation leads up a team in the Omaha area as well. Um, and so the Lincoln team, uh, what happens is that when there's a death by suicide, uh, the Lincoln Police Department has a protocol where they call one of our volunteers. So it's totally volunteer, but the volunteers are individuals who themselves have lost somebody to suicide, uh, who've been bereaved by suicide, and they've all gone through training. Uh, we have a clinical director who uh, interviews individuals who want to be a part of this team, and they go through training and um, they, uh, so it's a team of three, two individuals who've lost somebody to suicide, and then we have a licensed mental health clinician. Um, then those team of three then are called by our volunteer coordinator, and then the other three volunteers go to the family um, as soon as we get the call, and they provide a bag of resources to the family. But more importantly, um, what we've seen is the anxiety for the family just dropped dramatically as we walk in the door. When you say, hey, I myself have lost somebody to suicide, um, it's that peer-to-peer -peer movement that they know that, hey, you've walked in my shoes before. We, we don't know what they're feeling, but they know that they, we walked in their shoes. And that um, what research shows is that families who have contact with the loss team reach out for support themselves within 39 days, meaning they go to a support group or go to a therapist. Families who do not have contact from a loss team, meaning talking to another suicide survivor, wait upwards to almost five years before they reach out for help. So when we learned about this concept, we brought it back to Nebraska and we decided we needed to do this and to develop it here. And with the help of the Kim Foundation and um, with the Nebraska State Suicide Prevention Coalition, we've been able to spread that concept across Nebraska, but also been able to help it grow across the United States. Well, uh, Ken Burns, who's famous for his documentaries, is executive producing a new four-hour film set to be released in the spring of 2022. It's called Hiding in Plain Sight, Our Mental Health Crisis, and it's going to look at the experience of young people who live with mental health conditions and kind of focus on the importance of awareness and compassion. Good afternoon, I'm Ken Burns. People have often asked me why, after more than 40 years of making films strictly about American history, would I executive produce documentaries on subjects like cancer and genetics, and now youth mental health? Why? Many of our films have, in their own way, dealt with mental health issues. Abraham Lincoln was severely depressed. Meriwether Lewis of Lewis and Clark was bipolar. And of course, many tens of thousands of veterans of the Civil War, World War I and II, and Vietnam have suffered from PTSD and other health challenges. 
Today, our country is experiencing a mental health crisis, so the topic has to be confronted head on. This collaboration between America's leading brain and mental health advocates, foundations, corporations, and philanthropists, this great production team, and of course PBS, can make a major contribution to raising awareness about this issue, and in the process, give hope to countless people who have been reluctant, if not afraid, to ask for help. As a society, we continue to test the resiliency of youth without truly understanding how the stresses of today, including these unprecedented times, are impacting them. We've set out to listen to and to learn from America's young people, documenting their experiences, but also listening to how they are identifying new ways to address mental health challenges. It is a remarkable journey that we hope will capture the unique voices of these young people as they navigate an extraordinarily difficult moment in our country's history. We're very happy to share some early interview footage from this film in production. Thank you so much for your support of this important project. The only thing I know how to do is to share my own story and my own experience. I can't tell anyone what they can't see for themselves, but I can tell them what it was like for me, what happened to me, and what it's like now that I have recognized my own illness. It was something in the back of my head, really. It was not something that I didn't really worry about. My dad was an alcoholic, and just like the anxiety of him coming home at night, it's a strange thing to look back on and think to myself, I really didn't care about anything at that point. I remember a lot of nights where I would sit in my bed and cry, like, for hours after hours. I felt a lot of pain inside, and um, I, couldn't, I couldn't explain that. I couldn't relay that to other people outside. The feeling is like walking through, um, it's like being pulled down, being pulled into like quicksand. It affects my daily life all day, every day. To go to school, you know, you put on a face, a facade, you're happy, you're bubbly, and then you eat lunch alone in the bathroom. I started to self-harm. I learned it in a book that I read. I'm tired of the I'm tired of the voices. I'm tired of everybody labeling me and saying I'm crazy. What happens to people with a serious mental illness is that just like a serious cancer, it begins to metastasize. It, it, it turns into disability. I remember waking up and being in the psych ward and being like, what am I doing here? I had a very high opinion of myself. It gets complicated by substance abuse. Drugs and alcohol worked very well for me because they took that anxiety that I had and that sense of isolation and they eliminated those things. Drugs and drinking and um, that was kind of my excuse, like that outside excuse to, to match up that feeling of powerlessness inside. When I finally did like start to think like, oh, I'm probably an addict, I was like, no, like you're just lying to yourself, you know. When the suicide rate goes up, Nobody even knows about it. I still had a whole future that I had planned, you know. It's like I was planning the suicide, but at the same time, you know, I was making plans to like go out to the movies with my friends the next week. My life was gonna end one way, and that was being addicted to drugs, so why not start now? Like, I wasn't meant to be on this earth. Long sleeves, no one knew that what I was, no one knew what was on my wrist. It was actually on social media. These boys were harassing me about something I did. I like couldn't deal with it anymore. Yeah, I actually went through with it. I actually tried to hurt myself. Those are the moments where I have the best opportunity to plant a seed in someone else's mind. The fact of the matter is, if you don't show some vulnerability, if you don't speak honestly, then there's no truth. 
And if there's no truth, there's no connection. It's taken me a very, very long time to even speak openly about it. I think there's a lot of pressure in being vulnerable, especially now with social media and everyone judging you. My roommates don't even know half of this stuff that I'm telling you guys now. And I'm nervous, like I'm kind of shaking inside to even talk about it. But if I can even reach two people from everything I say or this story, then I, I did my part in this world. We don't understand how common it is we don't understand how important it is to talk about it and be open about it. So this is the problem that we all deal with in secret. And the result is that we don't deal with it well. Hiding in plain sight, our mental health crisis explores how young people are addressing their mental health needs and the impact of mental health stigma and stress on today's youth. It's going to look closely at what life is like for these young people, as well as for the parents, teachers, friends, and healthcare providers in their lives. We heard from many young Nebraskans today about how they struggled with mental illness and what has helped them. If you are in crisis or experiencing thoughts of suicide, please text the crisis text line. Just text HELLO to 741741 or call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That number is 1-800-273-TALK, T-A-L-K, or 1-800-273-8255. Both services are free and available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So as we wind down our discussion today, I do wanna go and, and spend a little bit of time uh, with just each one of our, our panelists and just get your uh, answer or, or your opinion on the fact that we've talked a lot today about causes, about um, warning signs, about risk factors, and about even um, possible solutions or, or ways to combat this crisis. But if you had one thing that you could say to someone who was considering taking their own life, or maybe who knows of someone who's considering taking their own life. I want to know what that one thing would be from your perspective, and each of you comes at it from a different perspective. Dr. Myers, I'd like to start with you. Yeah, I would say that, you know, that you're not alone, you know, that there is hope, there's help, there's healing. Um, you know, connect, ask for help, you know, utilize that phone number, 1-800-273-8255. Or go to your nearest emergency room. We, we have here at Brian West the 24-hour a day, seven-day mental health emergency room. But also consider this: uh, you know, if if you're went to the doctor and the doctor told you that your heart hurt, um, or that you were having um, heart pain, and you went to the doctor and the doctor said you need to go to a heart specialist, chances are you're going to go. Um, if you went to the doctor and the doctor said in, in that well you might be suffering from depression or anxiety you know you have suicidal thoughts um you probably should go see a therapist or a psychologist you probably should go see a, a, a psychologist or a therapist you know mental illness is a brain disorder and it's no different than any other illness that's out there it is treatable so please reach out and, and get help Miguel Estevez is a therapist in Grand Island, and I'm guessing you've been in this situation, possibly with some of your patients. What's your advice, Miguel? Yeah, vulnerability. I think vulnerability goes so, so far. The moment you share that deep pain, the thing that's hurting, the thing that you don't know what to do with, the moment you let that out, that's, a, that's healing. And will you consider doing that with your friends, with your family, with a professional? Uh, vulnerability gets us so far. And as a, as a societal level, if we can do that, we can truly, truly, truly bring healing. And also healing is, is achievable. Even if you feel that pain and if you feel like I might not heal from this, like healing is, in a, healing is beautiful in a way. So continue and, and say yes to that healing. It might take years. It might take a couple months. 
but healing is worth it. And someone that, you know, had suicide ideation at some point, uh, especially in 2015, 16, and, and, you know, I have continued to see my therapist. I continue to seek help because I know that. And at the same time, too, healing comes from community. Community brings healing. You're not alone. We love you. Great message, Miguel. And can you, uh, you said it so well, but can you summarize some of that for our Spanish speaking listeners as well? Yeah. Tu, tus vidas importan. No sé qué es tu problema. No sé qué es lo que te duele. Pero busca ayuda. Busca ayuda de profesionales como yo, profesionales en tu comunidad, en tus iglesias, en donde sea. Pero tu vida importa. Y, 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 y sea honesto con tus con tu esto. Tal vez no te sientes que, que alguien que te quiere o que, o que nadie te, te está escuchando, pero hay gente que te quiere escuchar. So, por favor, escoge vivir. And can you also give out that National uh, Suicide Prevention Lifeline number in Spanish as well? Yes. Y si necesitas llamar a un lugar, eh, si no tienes a nadie con quien platicar, llama al 1-800-273-8255. Thanks, Miguel. Julia Hebenstreit, uh, what would be your message? I think you might be on mute, Julia. Gosh, I told you I wouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would echo what both of them said um, so beautifully, but also in our programming, you know, in all of our titles of our program is hope and healing. And there is hope out there, even when it's difficult to find and healing is possible. You're not alone. I think that's one consistent message we've all told, um, but take the time to empower yourself to learn the warning signs, to know what to look for. Cause our hope is that you personally never experience this, um, but you never know you may and someone you love may too. And so it's very likely that you will come in contact with someone who is struggling and so know what to look for. And most importantly, if you identify those signs in yourself or a loved one, know where to get help. We can't recite that lifeline enough. It's 800-273-8255 and connect with help um, and, and just know that you're not alone. And Saisha, when it comes to this particular message in this discussion, we'll give you the last word. What's your message? Yeah, kind of what everyone has been saying, you're not alone, but also let's keep having these conversations, especially at a young age, and let's erase toxic masculinity and say men can have these emotions too. We all have feelings. We can talk about our flaws and not just what's portrayed on social media. Um, and for those dealing with anxiety like I am, let's focus on what we can control. So we can't control that a group is not following social distancing, but we can use hand sanitizer and facial covering. We can't control that classes are online, but we can control what our schedules every day look like. So focusing on that because there is a light at the end of the tunnel and we can all achieve it together. It's great advice. I want to take a moment just to thank our panel of experts from across the state of Nebraska. Uh, Dr. David Myers uh, from the direct is the director of behavioral health and services at Bryan Medical Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. Thanks so much for thank bringing you. your comments. We really appreciate it. Uh, Miguel Estevez is a therapist at the Friendship House in Grand Island. Best of luck to you, Miguel. Gracias. And uh, Julia Hebenstreit is the executive director of the Kim Foundation, a very, very good organization out of Omaha. Look them up online and, and learn more about them. But thank you, Julia, for your yeah. contributions today. Thank you. And thank you to NET for taking the time and highlighting this important subject. And uh, Saisha Adhikari is a uh, senior at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, majoring in biology, psychology, and public health. Thanks so much for bringing your perspective to the program and best of luck on your school year ahead. Thank you so much for everything. I want to thank everyone for participating and sharing your stories and your knowledge with us. And also to all those who listened and joined in the conversation, thank you as well. You can find mental health resources at wellbeings.org slash NET dash resources, where you can also learn more about the Wellbeings campaign to create awareness for better mental health for all. We'd like to leave you with one last piece on an organization called One Mind. Inspired by their son Brandon's schizophrenia diagnosis, Garen and Sherry Staglin created One Mind to bridge the gap they saw in mental health research and patient support. Let's listen to this interview conducted by Corey McCowan, a PBS NewsHour student reporter from Omaha North High School. On behalf of everyone here at NET who worked on this project and our panel, 
I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thanks for joining us. I'm Corey McCowan, a student reporting labs journalist from Omaha, Nebraska. And today I'm here with Gary Staglin, chairman of One Mind. Corey, hi. I'm really so happy to be here. What is One Mind and what resources do they provide? One Mind is a nonprofit organization, Corey, that was founded 26 years ago. It's a nonprofit, which means we're not a foundation, but we raise money through the generosity of many people around the United States. We founded the organization soon after the psychotic break of my son, Brandon, which was back in 1990. And he was in very bad shape, but we were fortunate to get the right resources, get him a good diagnosis. And he was able to go back to school, Dartmouth College, and graduate uh, on time with honors. And we said, wow, most people are not that fortunate. So we said, we have two choices, run away or run towards the problem. So we started running towards the problem. In today's world, I don't have to tell you and your listeners that we're all experiencing much higher levels of anxiety and depression. Why did One Mind get involved with the Wellbeings Initiative? So this will be one incredibly powerful way to get the message about everybody has somebody and brain health and mental health should not be something we're afraid of. It's things we should be doing something about. And in the long run, uh, this Wellbeings Initiative in this film was going to help us understand everywhere that this is chemicals, not character. Uh, if we work together, we can fix this problem, but you, everyone who sees this film and listens to your broadcast should be deputized to let no one feel shame or blame and get help if you need it. You previously were mentioning um, your own personal experiences dealing with your son's mental health challenges. So what advice do you have for parents who are experiencing mental health challenges with their children? First of all, don't blame yourself or each other when this happens. No one did anything wrong here. You weren't a bad parent. Second, there is no silver bullet. So do not think that you can just go to the doctor one time, take a pill, and it's all gonna be great. This is a chronic illness until our research changes it otherwise, but it's a lifetime illness. You have to have unconditional love. And Brandon is a symbol of what's possible. His is a story of tragedy to triumph. And then in what ways have you seen the pandemic affecting mental health? And are there any tips that you might have for people to help keep a healthy mind since we're still in the pandemic? When this first happened, it was more or less thought of like a sprint. But then we got to March, April, May, and now we're in August. So now we understand this is a marathon and you've got to take vacations. You can't just go full out because you'll burn out in that process. So Take care of yourself, make time for yourself, you have a regular routine, diet and exercise are more important now than ever. Thank you so much for allowing me to interview you. Um, I really appreciate it and thank you so much for your time. Good, Corey, it was my pleasure. Thanks for your insightful questions and good luck to you and your career and all of the, your audience that's out there. Thank you so much to tell the story of One Mind and the well-being.